Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mack, and we are here today with one of the featured poets for the ninth annual ASU Poetry Festival, Ms. Madeline Lassen. She's also the 2014 um, National Student Poet Award winner. Hello, Melon. Hi. Um, could you start us off before we start talking? Maybe share some of your art with the audience, if you don't mind? Yeah, so this is a poem I wrote called Elegy for James Booker. Call me in the middle of the night as I pubes and ask to speak to my father, the district attorney. I'll record our conversation and play it when I'm alone in public places. Let me have an absence of teeth so when I open my mouth, a listener can hear our coast eroding. Catch my fingers beneath yours, a nutria unearths my home. Orange teeth cut from the skeleton of the old tree that invented satsumas. Bring me with you to Japan. My father will give you a job in his office and I'll make you a suit brackish water cannot melt. Call it a piano and use my hands if you need them. Wow. Thank it's beautiful. Thank you. You have a really nice, distinct, poetic voice. Thank you. How, how did you get started in poetry? So I started writing poetry. My parents uh, gave me an antique bed when I was young. And I would go back there and I would just write a little line a day, just about the most interesting part of my day. So usually it would be about how mean my brother was to me. But uh, I just... I couldn't keep journals, I didn't have the attention span, but I knew that I wanted to hold on to pieces of what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. So I just started writing line by line and they turned into poems eventually. Wow, wow, interesting. So are there certain people whose voices, when you constructed this language, right, um, writing pieces in line by line, it became this poetic sort of experience. Are there certain, certain poets that sort of stand out that influence your writing more than others? or? Um, I would say my biggest influence is probably Marie Howe. Okay. I love her poetry. Um, it's just the voice has this intensity and this kind of um, lightness mm -hmm. that I really, really love and can't imagine um, writing without Marie Howe's voice in my head. So, so are there certain themes that you pick up on? Because a lot of poems, poets, like to write about certain experiences and topics. Are there certain yeah. topics that you sort of gravitate toward? Or? Um, I definitely write a lot about having a body mm -hmm. and, um, and being a female and what that means to me. I write a lot about the South and what it means to be a black female in the South and kind of thinking about those ideas and, um, and, and kind of the new normal of what it means to be a woman. The new normal. The new normal. Can you explain that a little bit? Um, I think it's just thinking, you know, uh, I because our roles as women are changing, we're not necessarily all going to be mothers, all going to be housewives, mm -hmm. and, and I really love that. And so just thinking about what is the purpose of my body if I'm not going to have kids one day, if I'm not going to um, be raising a family, uh, what am I good for? Am, am I not fulfilling my purpose? Am I fulfilling my purpose? You know, what is, do I have a purpose? Mm -hmm. and, and just thinking about that. Wow, wow. So um, when you, you are the... 2014 yes. National Student Port Award, Award winner. Yes. All right. Um, how did you get interested in that? How did that happen? Could you talk, talk to us about that? So it started with me just entering the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, which mm -hmm. is a fabulous um, award that um, com, com, arts competition that honors young um, aspiring artists and writers. It's actually the oldest in the country. And then through that, they filter into the National Student Poets Program, where they choose five uh, regional winners from across the U.S. to represent uh, each region as literary ambassadors for an entire year. Wow. How many um, people submitted that year? 13,000. 13,000. Yes. And you are one of five. <laughs> one of five. Right? And yeah. who made the selection? So we have a wonderful um, array of jurors. So one of the jurors was Terrence Hayes. Wow. Uh, Patricia Smith. Yes. 
Um, in past years, Kerry Washington has oh. been a juror. Uh, so it's really just an array of people, but all the people um, that judge the National Student Poets Program are passionate about art education and specifically what poetry can do for young people. Okay, so where was the award ceremony? The award ceremony was at the White House. Get um, out. Yeah, and so Michelle Obama uh, hosted us, and we gave a reading, and it was actually our first public reading. Mm -hmm. So it was in it was in the blue room of the White House, and it was a really special event. Uh, so you yeah. look really cute in that yellow dress you have. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that I would go for like a Jackie O look. Uh, well, so. that, and then I think I think there was a picture of you with Barack Obama. Yes. In the yes. Is a, was it that, was that I was a leather wearing, skirt? Yeah, I was wearing. I, 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 I love going to Goodwill, and so I can honestly say that every single outfit I've met the Obamas in has all been from Goodwill. Get so, out of here. Yeah. So. I, I, my bird I gotta go cage. back and look at that picture. Sure, yeah, all that of doesn't that look like a good Goodwill outfit. Well, New Orleans has really good Goodwills because we've got Mardi Gras, so people will kind <laughs> of <laughs> throw out weird stuff. And uh, hey, why can't you dress up like it, it Mardi Gras every it was, day? It was a nice look. Yeah, it was a very nice look. Oh wow, that's amazing. So, as a Port Award winner, um, what are some of the responsibilities? So. Um, during our year as a National Student Poet, you do a year of service okay. where we go around the country teaching workshops, speaking at poetry festivals like this, and, um, and we just kind of uh, expose people to poetry, people who wouldn't normally find poetry in their everyday lives. Um, and each service project has its own distinct personality. Like my friend um, who was representing the Northeast, she's from Sandy Hook, so she did workshops centered around gun violence and healing. Wow. Um, my workshop centered around uh, place and um, home and what it means to call to call a place home and and um, and how we reconcile that with uh, leaving. Um, thinking about Hurricane Katrina, and so. We're kind of working right now, because now I'm an alumni of the program, or an alum of the program. So right now we're working, um, trying to figure out ways that we can kind of uh, continue that year of service throughout our life and throughout our career as uh, whatever we end up being. So, um, so we're working on alum programs to continue the year of service uh, forward. Wow. Okay. So um, in addition to that, are there any other things that you have coming up that we can expect from Madeline in the future? Right now I'm just getting my degree, getting working on my bachelor's degree, and then um, and ho hopefully I just was awarded a fellowship um, with the Aspen Institute, so it's a sort of civic practice scholars, so I will be doing some, um, some events with them and some okay. programming with uh, the Aspen Institute. Okay, any more writing in the future or Yes, definitely. Always, always writing, probably not publishing just because um, just because I, f I feel like what I have now is I'm so young, I, I don't really want to I don't really want to put it out there yet, but maybe some publishing we'll say 10 years. No, oh, man, years. you can make us wait for 10 years. Come yeah. on. That's, well, you, you can, you can scour to, the internet you for You start to sound like Sade and Anita no, Baker, no. maybe you can wait 10, 12 years before oh, no. <laughs> whatever. Hear, but Stop. No, I, it's a dangerous thing, I think, to to put it out too early. I wanna I wanna put something out that I really enjoy and when really am, am proud of. So when I'm ready, I'll put something out. Well, you have a lot to be proud of already. Thank All you. Right? There, I mean, there's a reason why you're one of five. <laughs> All right, not because they had nothing better to do that day. Um, yeah. It's because you're a great talent. All right, so we're we about to end. Um, yeah. Do you mind sharing one more poem with us? Yeah, please? let me find another poem. They're all crumpled up in here. Okay, so this poem is called One Girl to Her Body If It Is the Night. You are not the absence I'd like you to be, flashing with stars, satellites, Roman candles. You look like the word down, like rising and falling, the gravity that softens apples, the word thing, the being outside and inside all at once, no pinprick of identity, but still singular, orbiting. I want to say we are the same. Earth floods me too. In all this time, someone had to point at you like they did the first star and say, that's a thing Littering light, stop 
and understand. I cannot shed you, your drippings. You answer, I was a house until I wasn't. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have a beautiful voice. Oh, thank you. Or, um, <laughs> thank you. And hopefully we'll hear more from Ms. Madeline Lassen in the very near future. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Hello and welcome to this very special presentation of the ninth annual uh, Albany State University Poetry Festival. And for this year, we are very privileged to have Pulitzer Prize winning and U.S. Poet Laureate Natasha Trethewey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And she's been so gracious after her reading, her wonderful reading. So I uh, hope you guys get the DVD with the reading on it because it was great. And so she's been so gracious to uh, give us some of her time and allow us to just kind of probe uh, her mind. So we have a couple of questions we want to begin. Uh, whenever I read your work, Mm -hmm. uh, I always think of the combination of the lyric, the narrative frame, mm -hmm. but it's the image that punches us in the gut. Yeah. So for our young writers, I want to know the way that you weave the lyric and the narrative frame and the image, how much of that is just second nature over all of your own reading and writing, mm -hmm. and how much of that is you're actually specifically consciously thinking about weaving these elements? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that... Um as a learner, uh, as a young child, I was very visual. And so the, the image is the, the sensory detail that first comes to mind to me. And so I'm very focused on um, trying to make a picture in my head. Right. Um, I first started writing about photographs in my first book because they were a way to sort of use uh, some evidence, some documentary evidence, and to describe it. Um, and then from there, I, I learned to take pictures of things in my head and describe them. I'm not always uh, upfront conscious about the, the lyricism mm -hmm. of a poem. I mean, the, the sort of sonic textures of the poem, the, the, the rhythm of it, mm -hmm. um, the cadences, uh, where I have pauses, um, where breath happens. Um, but at the same time, even as I'm focusing in the front on the visual image, mm -hmm. the, the, the lyrical part is working on me. I tap my foot the whole right, time. Right. I, I compose out loud the whole time because I have to hear right. the, the rhythm of sentences, right, um, right. Uh, which I'm very drawn to. And of course, the, sort of the third part of that that you asked me was about narrative. And I always love story. Okay. Growing up right. listening to stories, listening to my grandmother tell stories, right. you know, as you do when you're a child, sitting mm -hmm. under their feet, you know, trying to hear everything right. that they could do. And so um, having a, a, the, the story part is very important to me. But I also know that because I'm so drawn to narrative and to story, I can have a tendency to com be completely linear. Right. But I think it's the, the lyric mode mm -hmm. that undercuts mm -hmm. my uh, sort of more pedestrian linear right, tendencies. Right, right. So for example, in Native Guard, I used a lot of um, traditional forms that involved um, repetition and refrain mm -hmm. so that I had to keep circling back. So right. even as a story was advancing, mm -hmm. The, the, the lyrical nature of the form made right. me circle back. Right, yeah. right, right. Me, whenever I read your work, I'm always thinking, either consciously or unconsciously, about Saucer's notion of the sign and the signifier, mm -hmm. right? And that whole notion that, at some level, language is about investigating the gap between the sign and the thing that it signifies. Mm -hmm. And particularly for the, the African-American aesthetic, right? The, the distance between the oppressive class mm -hmm. sign, mm -hmm. right? Such as Christianity and mm -hmm. the distance between the sign Christianity and their behavior. Mm -hmm. With that said, there are two great lines that you have. One at, in, at the end of a poem that says enthralled by a word, to a word. Mm -hmm. And then the other is the distance between word and deed. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is looking at poetry as a battle over the context of a word. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about how you are investigating words and what they mean mm -hmm. when you're writing poetry? Well, I, I imagine that the nature of that investigation does go back, as you say, particularly for me as a black person um, and as a black biracial person growing up in Mississippi, having been named, mm -hmm. uh, having uh, the language of not only mm -hmm. custom, but also law right. in the state of Mississippi mm -hmm. name me. So th there, were, there were these words that I was 
enthralled to because they were the language of law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, to try to push up against that, which those things which are a kind of received knowledge, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, I think it's one of the reasons I spend so much time um, with the OED, um, because I'm interested in the, the history of right. words. Um, right. You know, not just the, you know the most basic of their um, denotation, um, mm -hmm. or even the connotations, the way we have sort of short, shortened them or used right. kind of shorthand to use words. But I mean, it's like the story I told mm -hmm. about finding out what the word "native" right. meant, right. Um, and I did a lot of that going back to figure out where the the origins of words were. Um, in, in in the poem I read, "Miracle of the Black Leg," the, the most strange discovery for me was that um, that, that little black mark that we call mm -hmm. a comma right. um, you know the, it's, its Greek origin mm -hmm. is a piece cut off and it does in a sentence pause right. us it's that sejura and so does every time I look at that black leg in those mm -hmm. paintings mm -hmm. it's a thing that gives me pause right. it's like what Roland Barthes would describe if it were a photograph as the punctum the thing that every time I see that it takes me out of the painting and into thinking so much about history mm -hmm. about not only the history of the word but the history of what was done in the name of right. certain words right. Right. Uh, your work, particularly Biloxo Ophelia, mm -hmm. Native Guard, and even Thrall, it, not just rooted in history, but understanding how history contextualizes. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, how do you see your work functioning in a, in a world now where we'll be getting get more and more historical amnesia? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I write about history as a way to write about the present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when I'm mm -hmm. writing about the past, I'm always writing about the present. Uh, you know, an, another example, I mean, everything that I'm trying to say in Miracle the Black Leg is about exactly this right. historical moment. Right. The way, you know, that, I mean, the, the Black Lives Matter right. movement, I mean, right. you can just put that the heading exactly. over that poem. Right. Because that's exactly what it's about. It's exactly. about how they plundered these bodies, mm -hmm. you know, for their own improvement or usage or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And it was sanctioned by Right. An angel, right. you know, right. a, 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 you know, a disciple exactly. of God, you exactly. know, is telling us that this is the way that things ought to be. Um, I I try to write about history to to fight historical mm -hmm. amnesia. I mean, mm -hmm. I do think that poems can do. My husband's a historian, right. so I I know that not everybody, you know, and he's a 20th century uh, civil rights historian. Right. Right. Not everybody's going to go out and read the next great book about right. the civil rights movement. Exactly. But maybe I read a, a poem about a cross burning mm -hmm. that happened because mm -hmm. exactly. of voter registration. Exactly. It's another way of, of trying to tell history so we don't forget. Very good, very good. I want to switch course just for a second back to literary devices. Uh, you've talked about or refer to your work as elegiac. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk a little bit about the elegy and, 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 and how do you see that unfolding in your work? Or how do you see your work responding to that? Well, you know, uh, Robert Haas famously in his meditation at Ligonitis wrote, um, a word is elegy for the thing it mm -hmm. signifies. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, everything's kind of elegy, right. you know. Right. Um, I always thought that photographs were mm. because mm -hmm. they, they capture and, and hold there a moment that is no longer. Right. Um, I mean, even the moment after the photograph's taken, right. that moment has ceased to exist. And also when you look at photographs, the one thing that they say to us again and again is that not only the documentary evidence of the person was here, but also they're no longer here and that those in them are also going to at some point be no longer here. Right. So I'm, I'm always concerned with what is slipping away mm -hmm. from us in that mm -hmm. way. And I, and I see poems as a way of of you know, giving us a momentary stay against right. the inevitable loss. Right. Right. Um, for a moment, a poem can bring my mother back mm -hmm. uh, in language, just for a moment, right. you know, right. and then right. she's gone again. Right. But right. That's good. the place that, if she still lives at all, it's in. Um, okay. Yeah, language. in the poem. Yeah, yeah in, in the, the language. Poem. In the language. I want to return back to just how you, the, the way you weave language. Uh, beyond Katrina your work, and then Jerry Ward's uh, The Katrina Papers. Mm -hmm. They both echo for me 
Gene Tumas Kane. Mm -hmm. And Kane was, was, was wonderful for me because reading it as a college student, it was like, what is this? Is it a poetry? Is yeah. it an essay? Is it short stories, right? right. And it's, it, so it's that whole notion of, right, it, it cannot be defined. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question for you is in the mixing of those genres, why did you feel a need to address that topic in that type of genre where, you know, you, you didn't feel the need to be restricted. You said, I'm going to write a collection of essays. Right. It's, it's, it just kind of all yeah. created in that form. Well, yeah, you know, I, it just occurred to me that um, um, there, were, there, were, there were parts of that story and parts of the experience of the story, the um, emotional level of the story, that couldn't be told in prose. Right. It took it right. took the the cadences of poetry, mm -hmm. uh, the the absences and the silences of a poem to speak louder than some of the more filled out spaces of prose mm -hmm. could do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes me think of um, I think it was the photographer uh, Steiglitz who said, um, "If I could tell the story in words, I wouldn't need to lug a camera." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Susan Sontag, you know, writing about photography said, um, nevertheless, the camera's rendering of reality must always hide more than it discloses. Right. And so I've got pictures in that book, mm -hmm. but I've got, as you say, poetry and prose because I think I needed all three right. to, t to try to tell the story because there's, there's spaces where some things I think can't quite go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, in telling the story, right, and in, 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 in types of genre compromises one may make in telling a story. I'm thinking about, say, okay, so Alice Walker's Color Purple being adapted to film, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking about, of course, uh, Native Guard being adapted, and also Black Sophia being adapted. Mm -hmm. And so the question uh, I would want to ask is, in those adaptations, mm -hmm. were there things that needed to be compromised or lost, or how do you feel about those adaptations in a way that the, the, the seamless storytelling and imagery was able to be told in their adaptations? Well, you know, um, so Bellox Ophelia had two different adaptations. One was um, a symphony that a colleague of mine created, mm -hmm. and, and there was a, a string quartet and one um, a soprano right. who did it. And, you know, he rearranged things, left out some things, um, and then there was a theatrical production that the students at Hollins University did. Um, and they had a poet helping them, uh, T.J. Anderson, helping them arrange things. But it also included dance and everything. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were great things about the choreography that they did with dance that I thought really added to it. Um, but, of course, they, they didn't stick to the, the text of the poetry exactly. Sometimes they would, you know, repeat things or, ta or, or skip over certain things. And so, you know, when you see that kind of thing happen, what you see is it becomes a very different work. Mm -hmm. right. Native Guard was different. Right. So what they did with Native Guard was not an adaptation at okay. all. We okay. started calling it... Um, a theatrical installation uh, because they literally read the book hmm. from cover to cover. Okay. Um, and there were four cast members, really. Right. There was the, a woman um, who sort of played the poet right, or right, me. Right. There was a young man who played the native guard. And mm. so he read, mm -hmm. uh, recited the soldier's parts. There was a, 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 a wonderful singer who gave, and, and a composer um, who played with her, who gave music to the many places that I quote, like mm -hmm. Nina Simone right, or right. Poor Wayfaring Stranger. Right. Um, and they added in a place where you might hear Dixie right, come right. in. I mean, right, strange right. things like that. Um, but because they did it in the exact order, mm -hmm. and because they, they, they I, I think it, was, it added to it. I, I thought it made it wonderful, especially for people who might not have thought they wanted to sit down with a book of poetry. Right, right. So they get to watch something. They, you know, let me stop and say, when they first approached me about doing it, I said, I read my poems pretty well. Why would you <laughs> right. need to get someone just to read my poems? Right. You know, that, right. how is this going to be any different than me what standing in front right. of an audience? Right. Um, but it was because then there, there was the whole stage set. Mm -hmm. there, there were ways that just a little bit of dramatization. Right. Right. And I, I, would, I would weep every time I heard mm. Nicole sing Poor Wayfaring Stranger. Wow. It broke my heart right. thinking right. of my mother. Um, 
And every time there was a moment where the, the guy who played the native guard would be sitting in the audience mm -hmm. in what looked like street clothes, mm -hmm. except he had a jacket and he would stand up when mm -hmm. it was time for him and he would put on that union mm -hmm. jacket right. and button it up and he would march down onto the sort of stage area and begin. And it was as if a ghost, you right. know, of some soldier walked exactly. into that room and I, I you know, it was... You can't, you know, right. as, as great as I might think that, you know, the book is just the words, there's something that that mm -hmm. theatrical installation added mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like we gave up anything. Right. Um, right. If you good. give up anything, it's, it's the connection that the audience might make with the real person okay. who's, I mean, right. you know, January, the, the, the actor who was sort of playing me, it's not her mother right. that she's talking right. about. Right. And I think right. there's a little bit of difference right. when you're standing up there and the people in the right. audience realize that that elegy you're reading is about, about your, your own mother, mother. Right. Exactly. and not exactly. playing a part exactly. about it. Exactly. You've been uh, quite uh, open about, in lauding about how important Rita Doves, Thomas and Bula mm -hmm. was to you and, 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 and how winning the Pulitzer Prize was continuing that torch. Mm -hmm. And so could you talk a little bit about how and why that's important to you as a writer? Because one of the things I always tell people that, that arrogance mm -hmm. is the product of ignorance, mm -hmm. that you cannot be arrogant if you know history. Right. And so, so talk a little bit about how having been, you know, a, along with others, but being so moved by Thomas and Beulah and how you felt that was important for you yeah. to continue that. Yeah, my father gave me that book when I, um, when I left Hollins. I'd done a year uh, in the MA program there, and I was on my way to um, UMass for my MFA. And, um, you know, it was, it was 1990, so she had only won the Pulitzer for it three years before, you know, mm, in 1997. Right, right. So the book was still very new, and he gave it to me, and I remember reading it and thinking, um, the, the, I felt so connected to the story mm -hmm. she was telling mm -hmm. because you know for a long time, I I'd felt that this the, the the world of my grandmother and the people of her generation you know people who were born in like you know 1905 right, and right. You know, 1916 right. they were they were dying and mm -hmm. they were and we were the, the community down there was changing so much and I started just wanting to record those stories and so right. then I saw Thomas and Beulah and here she is right. telling this story she's got a timeline so it's not it enlarged the story of her grandparents to not just her and her grandparents, but how these people were part of history. Mm -hmm. And their story was a, the larger history of, Ameri of, mm -hmm. of our American story. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you see that, and you realize that, you know, what feels very personal, what feels like, oh, I want to remember and record everything that my grandmother says. My grandmother just doesn't belong to me. She belongs to right. history. And there's right. something larger. Exactly. Um, that's humbling, right, right, you know? Right, right, right. Um, but I, I, I was so moved by that that I, I at that moment, sort of, sort of said to myself, I've got a book like that in me. I, right. you know, I'm, I don't know what will be my story yet. I, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I knew it had something to do with my family. And so domestic work sort of comes out of reading right. um, uh, Thomas and Beulah. A lot of the poems are uh, direct imitations. I mean, right. they, I, I sort of borrow the mm -hmm. first line and, right. and shift it around right. and, exactly. and, and, and go off As into young writers my, do. Yeah. Well, I think old writers ought to do it, too. <laughs> right. um, because I think it, it, it opens the door for uh, into your own stories. I mean, we're different people, so uh, I, I'm not going to write the same thing. Right. It's just a, it's like form. You know, I didn't invent the sonnet, but if right. I write one, if I use an old form like exactly. that, it's my own material that goes into it. Right. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. Thinking about that and thinking about the whole, uh, listening to you talk, I'm thinking about Stephen Henderson's book, The Militant Writer in Africa and America. Mm -hmm. And it, I was in college, and the term, and I've been using it my entire life, in fact, I've titled one of my collections of poetry after the term linguistic liberation. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the role of the poet is to engage in linguistic liberation. Mm -hmm. That's what draws me to Black Sophia, mm -hmm. was that what you are painting for me is a person who would not be defined. Mm -hmm. She was defiant, right? No, not that shoulder, this shoulder. No, no, you're going to get the shoulder I give you. Right. And what it really said to me was that no matter your condition, you can still control your dignity. You can't control anything else. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to talk a little bit about how conscious of you that you were painting dignity mm -hmm. when you were painting Ophelia. Um, you know, I thought when I was working on it, that, you know, the, all the books you read when you're working on something, um, 
You know, I read um, Shirley Ann Williams. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, both uh, her slave narrative, but then her poems, um, uh, letters from a New England Negro. What I was thinking of, um, I was thinking of a neo-slave narrative. Right, right. I mean, I really saw that right, as yeah. a neo-slave narrative because it really was the, the key to her mm -hmm. liberation mm -hmm. was that she had this voice right. that she was able to to write these letters and mm -hmm. to and to be defiant about the 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 way that she was being looked right. upon by right. society, but more it, in, more specifically her father at some point. Um, uh, her friend who was a school teacher, the men who come into the brothel. Right, right. I mean, she, she's always being named. Right. Uh, she's always being framed mm -hmm. and positioned. Exactly. And what she tries to do is, is to move herself out of that. And I, and I think she does it by uh, with language. She does right. it by... She, she keeps in mind this idea of bettering herself. And it to her, it comes through from from reading, from, mm -hmm. from what she can read, how she can write, and from that, how she may, you know, stand up inside of herself. I mean, it reminds me of my grandmother, because my grandmother was a proud woman. This is a woman who just lived through Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. But there would be moments, I mean, even toward the end when I'd be wheeling her around in her chair, if she'd been tired or slumped over, if she got in somewhere, she would sort of stand right. up in herself like right. this. Exactly. And it's just that idea of just, there's a way that you, she's still going to present right. what she needs to exactly. present. And Ophelia was struggling with that mm -hmm. uh, because at first she was so burdened mm -hmm. by the gaze of others right. upon her. It's, right. it's only when she breaks out of that. Exactly. Which is why at the end of the book I have her marching right out of the frame, mm -hmm. including the frame of the book that I've put her in. Right. I exactly. like to say I have no idea where she there went. There you go. Yeah. There you go. She, she paints. She, she paints. She almost becomes a photographer. Yeah. By the end. Uh, yeah. Of the, of the, she's taking the yeah. last picture exactly. that we see, and then she and when well then she's taking the last picture in one of her persona poems, and right. there's that last poem where she's being photographed, but it's from a, right. a time earlier. Exactly. But it's the moment that she realizes she's going to take, take charge control. of. Yeah. yeah. She's not gonna. She's not gonna be uh, the object of someone else's gaze. It will be her subjectivity that. So. That, that it would be her controlling mm -hmm. the picture that others see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I want to end with, with uh, I always have to return to a question about writing and something that for you, looking at young writers, mm -hmm. right? what's the one thing you want some 12 to 15 year old, or maybe even some college student says, that I want to be a writer. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that you want them to know most? You know, usually when I get a question that's similar to that. It, it's not that question. That's a better question. You know, what advice would I give? Right, and I, right. you know, you, I say things like, you know, read the OED, right, right. find those poets you love, and let, right. the, let those great poems be your teachers. But what I would really want them to know um, is it, something about how, how to find a way to make um, language a thing that works for you rather than a thing you try to hide behind. Mm. I feel like there are uh, a lot of young poets um, who uh, are playing with language in very clever ways as a diversion from actual emotion, mm. from, okay. from, from, right. from being willing to, 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 to dig deep right. and, to, be vulnerable. and be vulnerable right. and to talk about the things that hurt, that are right. difficult. Um, you know, Charles Wright, in his introduction to Best American Poetry a few years ago, said something like, he wrote, um, cleverness doesn't endure, uh, only pain endures and mm. the rhythms of pain. Mm. And I, I'd like for people not to be uh, afraid to, right. to find those places um, and to use language as a tool to help bring it about right. and not to hide behind it. I think that, you know, sometimes I say that to my students, and, and they think, well, you're such a drag because why do I want to think that everything is, is about pain or why is everything about loss? Why, you know, why is everything elegiac to you? Mm -hmm. And what I tell them is that you know, joy is that much sweeter right. because the other side of it is pain. And exactly. once you've known pain, it makes the joy a whole lot better. Very good. Very good. So we want to thank you for not only the wonderful reading and not only taking this time for us, but we want to thank you for continuing to be a wonderful educator. Not just about how to master language, 
but how to use language to educate and heal. Thank you. So thank you for participating in the ninth annual Albany State University Poetry Festival. Please pick up a copy of the DVD and also come because it is an experience for your mind and your heart. Mm -hmm. This is Celie McInnes for Natasha Trethewey. Thank you and good evening.